Hello, hello. This is an introduction and build tutorial for Shack IR. I have been very thorough in my research and hopefully have anticipated any and all questions that could be brought up, and anything that I've missed or overlooked, I will do my best to address either in editing this video or perhaps in future videos. Now as a quick briefer, I'll be organizing this video into several main chapters. The introduction, the parts list, the actual build, how to set up the software, and finally, I will briefly discuss how you can use Blender in conjunction with 3D printing to make a scaffolding for your track IR. I will make sure to post any and all links in the description, but I would like to make a point right now that some of the specific components that I use, especially the LEDs, even a month from now, may not be available. With that in mind, I've tried to make this tutorial with sufficient explanations that it might be relevant for years to come. Now first things first, the introduction to Track IR. Most of you are probably familiar with Track IR and what it does already, but for those of you that are not, Track IR is a head tracking system mounted on the side of your headset or on top of a hat. It utilizes either IR reflectors, or as I will show in this video, IR emitters. The emitters are arranged in such a way that the tracking software you are using will be able to determine the position of your head in the real world and will orient the in-game camera to look where you want it to look. And for any dedicated PC simulator gamer, I would consider the Track IR a must-have. Not every game will support Track IR, but most games that sell themselves as simulators, be it space sims, racing sims, flight sims, military simulators, they will often support Track IR. Arma 3 is probably one of my favorite games to play with Track IR. Because Arma 3 is a combined arm simulator, the benefits of Track IR can be seen at all levels of combat. Whether you are driving a truck, or a tank, or flying a helicopter, or a plane, Track IR eases the burden of using clunky mouse or hat stick view controls. But beyond that, Track IR actually fleshes out the infantry movement in the game, allowing you to quickly look around at objects independent of where you're aiming the reticle, as well as allowing you to softly lean around corners for better precision and concealment. In War Thunder, Track IR is a natural fit. While in Ground Forces it can be a little awkward and even unwieldy, it still retains its usefulness for keeping track of the battlefield situation. However, Track IR really was designed for aerial combat. With that in mind, taking out an airplane with Track IR in War Thunder simulator battles will add a whole new dimension to gameplay. In IL-2 Battle of Stalingrad, I cannot recommend the use of a Track IR enough. The heightened fidelity and realism of the aircraft create a level of immersion that can only be matched while using a VR headset. On top of that, the multiplayer scene is competitive enough that I would consider it a severe disadvantage not to be using a Track IR. For DCS World more than any other game, I would call Track IR a necessity. The hyper-realism of the aircraft, along with the obsessive attention to detail, make being able to quickly look around your cockpit absolutely paramount. On many aircraft, vital buttons or switches are hidden from view unless your in-game camera is in the correct orientation. Unfortunately, Track IR is a fairly expensive product, costing between $150 and $200, which for those of you that play DCS, where an individual plane can cost as much as $60, may not seem like such an inconvenience. But for those of you who are trying to make the most of a moderately priced or free game, say, War Thunder, that price tag can be a real deterrent. However, depending on what materials you have on hand, building your own track IR can cost as low as $30.
arguably the most important part of the tracker is the camera. For this, I recommend the PS3i camera. Equipped with a two-stage field of vision selector, it is widely available and a very cheap camera. Designed to work with the PlayStation motion controllers, its internal infrared filter is negligible, making this camera ideal for the tracker base. The next component is an infrared pass filter. This filter will block all visible light, only allowing through infrared light. There are many suggestions for various household items that can function in this capacity. However, for this tutorial, I will be using a legitimate 25mm 850nm infrared pass filter. For use with the PS3i camera, 25mm diameter lenses are just about a perfect fit. 850 nanometers refers to the cutoff for the wavelength of light that will be allowed through the filter. When purchasing a filter, there are only really two things you have to keep in mind. The first is that the filter needs to be able to block out all visible light. And the second is that whatever LEDs you decide to purchase have to have a wavelength of light greater than that specified on the IR pass filter. A good generalization is that visible light ranges from between 400 and 700 nanometers, and that infrared LEDs often emit light at a wavelength between 800 and 1000 nanometers. The next component is a mounting clip for your camera. This is a mounting clip specifically designed for use with the PS3i camera. If you are not using the PS3i camera, it may be necessary for you to have to build your own mounting clip. For this, I recommend cabinet hinges. I will post a link for the exact hinges I'm using, however I cannot recommend them as a more economic alternative to an official mounting clip. The last important component for the base are the drivers for the camera. The PS3i camera does not work natively with computers. Because of this, you will need to purchase third-party drivers. The drivers cost $3 and will likely be the cheapest purchase you make for your Track IR. As part of the purchase, you will receive a test program to make sure that your camera is fully functional. Now we'll cover the parts for the headpiece. The first parts are the LEDs. The ones that I am using are rated at 940 nanometers well above the threshold of my filter. When picking an LED, there are a few things to consider. The first is the wavelength of light that it emits, and again, it has to be higher than your filter. The second is the maximum forward current that can move through the LED. In general, the higher the maximum forward current, the brighter the LED will be. I will caution you right now, do not buy cheap LEDs in large quantities. They will be too dim and too low quality for your build. Finally, pay close attention to the graph that displays radial intensity over angular displacement. Try to find an LED that retains about 50% of its brightness at a 20 degree viewing angle. During the build, we will be sanding the LED lightly on all sides turning its regular glass lens into a makeshift diffuse lens, so don't worry too much about trying to find the LED with the highest viewing angle. All of this information can be found by searching for the LED's datasheet, and are often in the form of a PDF file. The next major component are the resistors. In this build, we'll be using two resistors in the circuit. The total needed resistance of the resistors will vary depending on the batteries you use, as well as the maximum current allowed by the LEDs. Resistors are relatively inexpensive, so if you do not know exactly what you need and you want room to experiment, you can purchase them in large packs with a lot of variation. However, I recommend that prior to purchase you figure out exactly what resistors you need for your circuit and just buy those resistors. Now it's not really a part, 
but I want to mention that during the build, it is absolutely necessary that you solder your wires together. This will guarantee the best functionality for your build. You will also need electrical tape. The colors are optional, but I definitely recommend having at least one roll of black and one roll of red. The next part you will need is the battery box. Make sure that the battery box you use will accommodate the batteries you've decided to use for the circuit. For my build, I'll be using AAA batteries and a AAA battery box holding two batteries, totaling at 3 volts. I would also like to recommend rechargeable AAA batteries, but be aware, they often have a lower voltage than disposable ones. Whatever battery box you choose, I recommend that it has a built-in on-off switch. This will save you a step in not needing to solder on a separate on-off switch. Next you'll need the wire. I recommend having at least one spool of red and one spool of black wire, and of course, the tools to strip them as well. Finally, the last material you'll need is just a small sheet of cardboard, as well as a ruler, an X-Acto knife, and just a pencil to trace. Now I'm briefly going to talk about the program OpenTrack. OpenTrack is a free, open source tracking software that is continuously updated and supported, and a link will be in the description. I also want to briefly mention another popular tracking software, FreeTrack. FreeTrack is identical in most regards to OpenTrack, however, when I tried it, it was unable to recognize the PS3i camera as a device so I cannot guarantee that it will work. Now we can start the building process. The first thing to do is to attach the infrared pass filter to the PS3i camera. Make sure you orient the filter so that it shares the most amount of surface area with the surface area on the camera. For my adhesive, I'll be using black hot glue. I personally prefer hot glue because of its fast dry time, and it is thick enough that it is unlikely that any will seep behind the filter. I am using black hot glue specifically so that it is unlikely that any light will be able to penetrate behind the filter. However, this is just a preference. Other adhesives with careful application will achieve the same quality. Whatever adhesive you use, make sure you keep the camera pressed against the filter for as long as it takes for said adhesive to dry. You don't want any to seep back behind the filter. And after a quality check, that's really the end of building the camera. Next we move on to the mounting clip. Just a reminder that you can buy an official mounting clip designed to work with the PS3i camera. And if you do, you would be finished at this point in the build. However, if you are not using a PS3i camera, or you don't want to use an official clip, this is how you would go about building one. Start by grabbing two cabinet door hinges. A 
Again, use your preferred adhesive. For this build, I'll be using super glue. Apply your adhesive and keep the pieces pressed together for as long as it takes for your adhesive to dry. While drying, make sure that the pieces continue to be lined up. When building the clip out of door hinges, one of the hinges will likely be stiffer than the other. You want that stiffer hinge to face towards the back of the camera, because most of the weight will be on that one. With the hot glue and the super glue both sufficiently dry, we can finish this build of the Track IR base. Take the opportunity to check that everything is solid and functional. Again, I'll be using hot glue to attach the pieces together. I'll start by filling the cavities in the door hinge all the way with hot glue. Then I make sure that I add enough extra for ample surface area contact. And then I simply keep them pressed together for long enough to allow the hot glue to solidify. And that's the end of building the base. Now before we get started on building the headpiece, I want to talk a little more about open track. There is a lot of flexibility when deciding on the measurements of the headpiece. However, the basic shape must conform with the model currently displayed. For this tutorial, I will be using the default values 30mm, 40mm, 70mm, and 80mm. We start this build with a sheet of cardboard. My first step is to mark out the overall position of the LEDs and their associated segments. 80 millimeters, 70 millimeters. Make sure to heavily mark the end of this line as it shows where the middle LED will be positioned. Forty millimeters, and thirty millimeters. Now I'm connecting the marked positions of the LEDs. For the top LED position, I mark one centimeter up and one centimeter back. For the bottom LED position, I mark one centimeter down and one centimeter back.
From the middle LED position, I mark one centimeter back and one centimeter up and down. Connect the upper two and lower two sets of marks. Again, from the middle LED position, I mark four centimeters back. And follow it with two centimeters up and two centimeters down. And then I draw a horizontal line to the left until it intersects with one of the diagonals. I then repeat for the other mark. With the scaffolding marked out, it's now time to cut it out of the cardboard. And that's the basic scaffolding for the headpiece. Next we cover the entire scaffolding in electrical tape. I'm going to recommend using a dark color despite me using the red electrical tape. When mounted on your headset, the track IR will likely be just within your field of vision. With dark colors in low light, you won't even know it's there. There is no most efficient way of doing this. Just aim to have the cardboard completely covered. Once you're finished taping, double check all over the scaffolding to see if there are any parts you missed. Now it's time to sand down the LEDs. I've tested a few different grades of sandpaper, and as far as I can tell, there is no discernible difference in quality. However, for reference, I'm using grade 60 sandpaper.
Make sure you wipe off any of the additional plastic powder. You're looking for a nice even sand all around the LED. Once you have all of your LEDs sanded, you can go ahead and position them on the scaffolding. Make sure all the LEDs are oriented in the same way. I prefer orienting the positive sides of the LEDs on the left side of the scaffolding. And remember, the LEDs should be placed as close to the measured position as possible. If you want, you can take the time to anchor the LEDs in position now. However, they will be anchored later on anyway after you apply the solder. This is a diagram of the circuit we'll be building. As you can see, it has three LEDs, two resistors, and one battery pack. The LEDs are arranged in a parallel circuit, while the resistors are arranged outside the parallel circuit in a series circuit. For this tutorial, we'll be assuming that the LEDs, the wire, and the battery pack all have a resistance equivalent to zero. Now using the equation V equals IR, where V equals 3, and I equals 100 milliamps, or one-tenth of an amp, I can determine that the resistance needed is 30 ohms, or resistor 1 plus resistor 2 must be greater than or equal to 30 ohms. With that out of the way, we'll start to measure out the lengths of wire we'll need for the circuit. Start with one red wire and one black wire, both about 2.5 to 3 centimeters in length. For the next wire, I have found that a simple way of judging an adequate length is to simply measure out a length of wire from its LED position to the corner directly opposite it. Then use that red wire to cut a black wire of equal length. Again, measure from the LED position to the opposite corner. Then cut another equal length of black wire. Next strip a centimeter or a centimeter and a half off of each wire.
bend the newly exposed wire in on itself, creating a loop. Bend the tip of the loop to a 90 degree angle. This will provide a large surface area for the solder to cling to. Repeat the same for the other wires. Next strip between 2 and 2.5 two and centimeters off the short wires. And now I'm just looking to see how all the wires will fit together on the scaffolding. Next, we need to strip the medium and long lengths of wire. Take a look at where the wires intersect on the scaffolding. It's a pretty good indicator of where you should strip the wire. Use the positive wire to determine how much of the negative wire you need to strip. Now repeat the previous steps for the longer lengths of wire. Now that that's complete, line up all the red wires on the positive side of the scaffolding. Align all the wires on the scaffolding and double check that they all intersect in about the same spot. Once you're satisfied with how the wires align, go ahead and twist them together. Slip the positive wire set onto the scaffolding and then repeat for the negative set. Once you have the sets aligned where you want on the scaffolding, go ahead and tape them in place.
Now it's time to get out your resistors. I know that the resistors I use need to have a total resistance equal to or greater than 30 ohms. So for this build, I'll be using one 10 ohm resistor and one 22 ohm resistor for a total of 32 ohms. Take the time now to loop the ends of the wire sets. Now loop your resistors so they can be attached to the wires as shown. Do this for both resistors. Now we're going to go ahead and strip the wires on the battery case. Make sure to twist the newly exposed wires together. We're ready to solder, but before you do, I recommend that you use the camera you've made already to test that the circuit you've just built works. Go ahead and perform any final checks to make sure that everything is in the right position. Once you are satisfied, you're ready to begin soldering. It does not take a lot of solder to connect the wires to the LEDs, but the more solder you put down now, the more secure the LED will be to the scaffolding, assuming you haven't used any other adhesive. Once satisfied, repeat for the other side. Now attach the resistors to the wire loops and solder them in place. Double check your work and then solder the second resistor. This is a good opportunity to bend the exposed anodes and cathodes to the scaffolding.
This is where having black and red tape is really important. Wrap the base of the negative branches with black tape. Then repeat on the positive side with red tape. Now it's time to secure the rear of the sets to the scaffolding with tape. Now it is time to attach the battery pack to the scaffolding. I recommend attaching the battery pack to the opposite side of the scaffolding that you plan on applying Velcro to, as well as applying it so that the on-off switch faces outward away from your head when worn. Now connect the wires coming out of the battery pack to the wires coming out of the scaffolding. Slip the wire through the resistor loop and twist the excess wire around the loop. This will make a strong connection and allow ample surface area for the solder to cling to. Take this opportunity to double check the connections. Once you're satisfied, solder the remaining connections. Once the solder is cool enough, wrap the exposed negative wire with black electrical tape. Then repeat on the positive wire with red electrical tape. At this point, none of the wire coming out of the back of the scaffolding should be exposed. You can also take the opportunity to wrap electrical tape over any other exposed wiring, but it's not strictly necessary. Finally, it's time to add the Velcro so you can attach it to your headset.
And that's it. Congratulations, you've built a track IR. Now I want to take a moment to go over some key characteristics of OpenTrack 2.3. The first two features are profiles and curves. Different games treat the game camera differently, and the curves are a way of fine-tuning that camera for a desired effect. You can set up curves for yaw, pitch, and roll, as well as the X, Y, and Z axes, allowing for fine-tuning of all six degrees of freedom of movement. The x-axis on the graph is the number of degrees you turn your head in the real world, while the y-axis is the number of degrees the virtual camera will turn in-game. And these different curves for different games can simply be saved as profiles for OpenTrack. You can even set up OpenTrack to start automatically with a specified profile on detection of the game's executable file. Next I want to cover recentering. Over extended periods of time, the tracking will likely become slightly skewed, resulting in a mismatch between looking straight ahead in-game and in real life. This can be caused by shifting in your seat, adjusting your headset, moving the base camera, etc. You will want to bind a key or key combination so that when this happens, you can reset the program without tabbing out of your game. Finally, I want to cover calibration. By default, OpenTrack assumes that the center LED is also the pivot point for your head. This is indicated by the red cross. However, depending on the size of your headset, your track IR can be located quite far away from your head's pivot point. This assumption will cause inaccurate tracking. There are two ways to calibrate it. The first is if you happen to know the exact distance away from your pivot point that the track IR is in terms of X, Y, and Z, you can manually input that data. More likely, however, you will just want to run the calibration program. To do this, start tracking normally, then in the Model tab of the Options menu, you will see the option to perform a calibration. All you need to do is yaw your head left and right a couple times, then pitch your head up and down a couple times, then stop the calibration. Then recenter your camera, and you will know that the calibration was a success if the little preview octopus does not move along the X or Y axes while you are yawing and pitching your head. Now as a last little topic, I would like to briefly cover how to use Blender in conjunction with 3D printing to make a scaffolding for a track IR. When building the model in Blender, it's best to assume that one Blender unit is equal to one centimeter because most track IR software works in millimeters. Once you're satisfied with your model, export it as a .stl file. When you open up the STL file, Windows 10 will automatically open it in 3D Builder. From here, you can continue to edit it further or send it to a 3D printer. I hope that you have enjoyed this video. And more importantly, I hope that it has helped you to build your very own track IR. Again, I'll do what I can to answer any questions that may be left over, and links will be in the description. Thanks for watching. Cheers!